Using a Self-Designed Video Game to Improve Writing Outcomes by David Neville, Digital Liberal Arts Specialist at Grinnell College, presented on 10 December 2016 at the Immersive Environments Colloquium at Vanderbilt University. In this presentation, I will briefly explain what an activity system is before drawing parallels between game-based and real-world activity systems. I will then describe in greater detail how I created a 3D digital game-based language learning environment before concluding with a description of how this environment was evaluated and what students learned by being immersed in it. In my presentation yesterday, I suggested that activity systems can play an important role in understanding and designing digital game-based learning environments. But what is an activity system? In an activity system, the subject is an individual whose agency is the point of analysis. The activity performed by the subject is directed at an object, which is modified with a specific goal in mind. The subject makes use of internal and external mediating instruments, such as tools and language, to accomplish this task. The community is comprised of multiple individuals who interact with the same object and who share the same goal. The division of labor refers to both the horizontal division of tasks between the members of the community and to the vertical division of power and status. Finally, rules are explicit and implicit regulations, norms, and conventions that constrain actions within the activity system. A person in a train station may, for example, interact with objects and people located within the space with the specific goal of boarding a train on time. This individual will read signs, ask questions in German, and interact with other members of this train station community, such as conductors and ticket agents. This interaction will be influenced both by linguistic and sociocultural rules. A porter will help you get your bags onto the train, whereas the conductor will check your ticket and throw you off the train if you do not have one. It's probably a good idea to use the formal form of address with both. Video games make use of similar activity systems. A player assumes a game identity that is closely connected with specific tools and abilities. These tools manifest both strengths and weaknesses based on the state of the game. As the game is in a constant state of flux, it is important to have a team with a broad range of player abilities to manage any eventuality in the game. This division of labor necessitates cooperation and collaboration. Game-based activity is constrained, but also empowered, by rules of the game, social convention, and division of labor. What emerges through this activity is a community of practice that explores different approaches to a problem and articulates a best possible solution. Since players can change their game identities, they can also experience this problem from different perspectives, which leads to a broader understanding of the problem space. Or, alternatively, players can choose to stick with one identity for a long time, developing a more nuanced and deeper understanding of the problem in different situational contexts. The important thing is that, at the end of the game, the player has a story to relate, a personal narrative that situates the how, when, and why in a specific context. It's this affordance, the ability that video games have to generate mental narratives through game-based activity that I want to discuss now. In developing my own game, I felt that, in order to create a rich environment for generating these narratives, the game world needed a layer of authenticity and a story of its own. I hoped that this authenticity would facilitate the transfer of knowledge between contexts. In other words, if the game world can be made to resemble the real world as closely as possible, perhaps students will be able to take what they learned in the game with them when they go to Germany. And thus was born the fictional German town of Bad Oberdinkelheim, located southeast of Bad Kamberg on German Federal Highway 8, a historical road in southwestern Germany that has existed since the 9th century. Here's a modified Google map of the region with Bad Oberdinkelheim, indicated by the red arrow. Situating the fictional town in the game environment was accomplished by modified signs based on real-world models, which you can see here in the inset. Other signs indicated dimensions of the game environment, such as the width of the tower passageway, to give players a sense of scale. Spatial rules were also encoded in these signs, 
such as the one you see here indicating priority over oncoming vehicles. Here's another sign describing spatial rules. Delivery vehicles are allowed in the pedestrian zone on weekdays during the times indicated. Although I did not do it in this game release, it would be interesting to build game quests involving the reading of these signs. For example, a quest that requires the player to successfully deliver a package to a store in the pedestrian zone, which then unlocks information for future quests. I also wanted to provide a bit of political and social background for the fictional town. Stasi 2.0 is a catchphrase of a German civil rights campaign against a preemptive telecommunications security strategy. Although I originally intended this graffiti to simply spark classroom discussion, it would perhaps be interesting to build another game quest involving this graffiti. Before I move on to the next slide, I want you to notice two posters on the wall next to the entrance to the City Museum and Visitors Information Center. Since Bad Oberdinkelheim is supposedly located just 15 kilometers north of the Roman Limes, I thought it would be important to mention a bit of this history in the game. On the left is a poster announcing an exhibit of coins from the late Roman Imperial period that have supposedly been found in the region. On the right is a poster announcing a special exhibit entitled Bad Oberdinkelheim, 2000 years. Again, I was hoping that these signs would spark classroom discussion. At the very least, perhaps somebody would appreciate and comment on the level of detail in the game. The objectives of the game were very straightforward. Based on your understanding of German waste management and recycling systems, clean up the pedestrian zone by picking up discarded bottles and trash and placing them in the appropriate receptacles. Again, I tried to make the bottles and trash as realistic as possible to add a layer of authenticity to the activity. The receptacles I developed were based on real-world objects, with the exception of the German text around the mouth of the receptacle to guide player activity. For example, Braunglas einwerfen, throw away brown glass. These receptacles are, in effect, tools that encode the rules of the space and help direct players along the correct path to achieve a goal. The game, therefore, makes use of most elements found in an activity system. A subject, a student playing the game, uses tools, receptacles, and language to sort objects, bottles, and trash based on rules, their understanding of German recycling and waste management systems, with a goal in mind, clean up the pedestrian zone. Since programming non-player characters and dialogue trees was beyond my expertise at the time, I was not able to represent a complete activity system by including people you would possibly meet in a German pedestrian zone. For example, students from the local university or people on their lunch break. I hope, however, to revisit this missing aspect in the future. But did the game actually help students learn German two-way prepositions? To test the effectiveness of the game, I devised an experiment that was comprised of in-class instruction and group work, individual homework, and the creation of a written narrative. In-class work was comprised of slides that visually anchored the topic and class discussion to model vocabulary and grammar. Students would then reinforce their knowledge of the activity system through in-class group work that required them to sort vocabulary into categories found in the system. For example, the blaue Tonne, the blue bin, is used for recycling paper and cardboard. At home, students would read a level-appropriate text describing how the activity system works. And then they would complete a short story that modeled the situation they would be required to write about in their narratives, cleaning up a pedestrian zone. The short story focused on appropriate use of two-way prepositions and vocabulary related to the topic. After all these steps were completed, students would apply what they learned in these activities towards the creation of personal narratives describing a situation which they helped clean up a pedestrian zone. Students in the experiment group would play the game before writing their narrative. After reading through several of these narratives, samples of which I have translated here, I started to notice a trend. Students who did not play the game, although their grammar was more polished, tended to focus on the final act 
of disposing the bottle or trash into the appropriate receptacle. The narratives felt as if they were simply academic exercises. Students who played the game, however, used more verbs to describe their activity, and their narrative situated this activity in a richer, imaginative world. It was as if these students were describing an event that they had actually experienced, although their grammar and presentation were more unpolished. I wondered if the roughness of their narratives could be attributed to the immediacy of their experience, which still needed to be sorted out and mentally processed. When I coded these narratives and ran an analysis on them, I found that students who played the game were more likely to use verbs describing how objects were located, picked up, and moved to the appropriate receptacle. In the case of acquiring objects, the difference between the control and experiment group was statistically significant, which is not surprising considering that the main activity in the game was picking up bottles and trash. Students who did not play the game focused almost exclusively on the last step, disposing bottles and trash. I also found that students who did not play the game wrote narratives that focused narrowly on the tools of the activity system. For these students, their conceptualization of the problem space consisted of paper wrappers, recycling containers, discarded bottles, and trash cans. Students who played the game, however, had a much broader perspective of the problem space that included trees, benches, the ground, and buildings. Objects were more likely to be described in relation to each other, and a few students even made mention of objects being in their hands or at their feet. They had, in sum, a more holistic view of the activity system, including how it was situated in relation to the world and their own body. Based on my experience with the 3D German game, it seems to me that activity systems could be a potentially fruitful way of aligning gameplay with learning objectives. For any given activity, it may be useful to design quests that experiment with the closest touching elements of the activity system triangle. For example, a quest exploring the interplay between the subject, rules of the space, and the communities that exist there. What interesting frictions could be explored and lessons learned by allowing players to make mistakes based on social, cultural, and historical misconceptions of a simulated space? What if I had designed the game to allow students to recycle bottles at a time when it was not permitted? How would residents in a neighborhood react to bottles being broken late in the evening? What would this tell students about German culture? So, in conclusion, what have I learned from this experiment and how could it be useful for this colloquium? Although it was a lot of work, the process of developing the game was extremely fun. You definitely need to try it. Details that are added to the game create an opportunity for interpretive richness that I was not able to fully explore or leverage in the game. To draw students fully into the immersive environment, it would perhaps be a good idea to develop quests around these details. Using activity systems to guide this development may help align the quest with learning objectives. Although I had students play the game after slogging through the homework and written activities, they still seemed unprepared to write an essay. Perhaps I should have done it the other way around allow students to have a powerful emotional experience in the immersive environment, and then layer written activities over this experience to give it linguistic form and structure. It seems to me that we still need to articulate instructional best practices for using immersive environments. Finally, although I designed the whole game on my own, it would have been much easier had a small team of developers been involved. Such a team, I think, could potentially be the core of a fledgling digital humanities program at a liberal arts college or university.